the space there, it's quite empty, I want to go and pray. So then my teacher said something very beautiful to me. He said to me that, why do you want to go pray there? I said, I've desired to pray in Riyadh al all my life, and now I have the chance, I want to go pray. So this is when he gave this principle to me. This is when I learned this principle. Of us- this usul of fiqh. That deen isn't what you want it to be. Deen and religion isn't what you want. You can't define what religion is. Deen and religion is that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined for the ummah. For the nation, for all the people that will come to the day of judgment. Now how did that principle fall in place here? He said I couldn't go. Why couldn't I go? What's in, what was wrong with going at that time? It was after Asr Salat. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he prohibited the Sahaba from praying Nafil Salat after Asr Salat. Therefore, I wanted to do something which my shulk and my just by my desire was pushing me to do. But it's right there, the place is open, I can go and pray right now. But Sharia, what was the taqaza and the demand of Sharia? That I do not go and pray there. Do you understand? So the desire wanted to go pray there, but Sharia said, you cannot go and pray there. Now you can go and sit there, but you can't go and pray there. So therefore, the correct thing to do at that time is to suppress your desires and to follow that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made thee. This is something extremely important. And wallahi alayhi this is a very important usul I'm saying. Because if you have this usul and this principle in your mind, your love for bid'ah will leave. Your love for innovations will leave. Many times that happens is many of us we come from countries and cultures that are deeply embedded with bid'ah and innovations. You know, a lot of things that we do in our lives are based on tradition. Have nothing to do at all with the sunnah or the Qur'an. Many times it happens. Okay? For example, I went to one person and we saw one person praying salah. And the salah he was praying was called salat ghawsiyah So I, said to, I asked his brother that I've never heard of this salah in my entire life. What kind of salah is this? How are you praying the salah? I've never heard of this salah in my entire life. Can you please explain to me? So more or less, I don't remember the whole procedure. It was a very lengthy, long procedure that I've never heard of before. But anyway, when some, it was someone like this that you pray two rakah and you face the Kaaba and then after the two rakah, then you face towards Majd al Nabwi and you pray two rakah in that direction then after that direction is over then you stand there then you stand up after the four rakat and you read salawat eleven times and each time you send salawat you, you, walk, um, you walk one step towards Baghdad or Kufa where Ghosi Azam Mawana Dukhada Jilani Nakhtalali is buried and a very funky salah as I like to put it very interesting salah so I said to this person what you're doing has no basis in Sharia. It's not possible to be in Sharia because Mawlana Abdul Qadir Jilani Ali was born way after the departure of Rasulullah Sallallahu and the Sahaba. It's not possible to be in the Sharia and you have to understand that. It's not possible. So this person then he said, well, you know, this is what I learned from my forefathers. So this is something very important. That what we learn from our forefathers, unless there is proof for it in Sharia, can we bring it into our deen? Can we bring it into our deen? No, we can't. Okay? So, Right here, again, bringing that, bringing that context back to where we were. Okay? Bringing that whole usul and understanding that principle and now coming back to where we were. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling the sahaba that your deeds, whether it be your hijrah, whether it be your jihad, whether it be your ta'aleem, whether it be your tabliq, whatever you want to do, if you do not have the permission of your parents to do that thing, then you can go and do it if you want to. But the hub of Allah and the barakah will not be there. What this brings us back to is understanding the most important thing for those of us who have our parents alive is to keep our parents happy. To be obedient to our parents. And a person that takes care of his parents, the one who looks after his parents, the one who is kind to his parents, he will gain the reward of all those things that he could have been engaged in if he wasn't serving his parents at that time. So he isn't being deprived of any amal at all. And I proved this last week through the story of Uwe Saqarani, where this individual he did not go to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because he was taking care of his parents. He was not deprived of the blessings of meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was deprived of the title as a sahabi. But his connection with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was as firm as it was with any other sahabi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa dua for that person were far more than many of the sahaba were getting duas from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa How Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had respect for this person was at another level altogether. So, Understanding this is a very important usul that pleasing one's parents is the ultimate goal of one person's life, of a person's life. And again, why is this? Because there are two types 
of hukuk that a person has. You have hukukullah and hukukul ibad. What are hukukullah? The rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hukukul ibad, the rights of the human being. The rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the most important thing for every person to look after. We should not write, violate the rights of Allah and there's no reason for any person to violate the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no dispute that those rights are the highest rights. Once a person is being considerate of the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next group of rights are hukuk al ibad. So the most important thing is hukuk Allah. Accept it? Right? There's no dispute, no, no second part and that is it. The most important thing is the hukuk Allah. Okay. Then comes the hukuk al ibad. In hukuk al ibad, the rights of all the servants and all the creation around you, whose rights are the highest? The parents. And then after the parents, and even in the parents, the mother, the father, the close relatives, the neighbors, and then that it carries on, you know, al-aqrab, al all those people that are closely acquainted with you, till the last person that's closely acquainted with you, a person should take care of all their rights. So the highest rights that come after the rights of Allah are the rights of the parents. Now the reason why, now some people will discuss and question that, why are the rights of the parents so high? Why not the rights of a friend? Why doesn't the Qur'an and Hadith say that the rights of those people who are most kind to you, their rights should be fulfilled first, and then, you know, the person who is most kind to you, the person most kind to you? The answer to this is, that every person that loves you, or shows any affection to you, or is to any limit acquainted with you, he will always have a reason to do so. Every person will have a reason to be close to you. Okay, whether it be that person's knowledge that you're in love with, whether it be that person, he wants to be close to you because, you know, you're very funny, or you may want to be close to that person because of their, because of their, uh, because of their, their, their reach in society, because of their fame, because of their wealth, because of their power. Every person has a connection with another person based on something. There has to be something that brings you in common, that brings you together. There has to be something there, okay? There's usually something or the other that brings two people together. The only person who will give you their love without any reason at all is your parents. These are the only individuals who will love you without any reason at all. Whether you give something to them or not, they will still love you. Whether you're handsome or not, they will still love you. If you're not even handsome, if you're ugly as anything, that mother will still sit there kissing your forehead saying, Oh my son, you look like the moon. Whether you're wealthy or not, that mother will still adopt you and she will always keep you in the house. She will never, you know, renounce you from the house or kick you out of the house. No, that won't happen. Do you understand? Whether you are married, not married, whether you have children or you don't have children, whatever the state is, that mother will never leave you. She will always and always and always be with you. And this is a given fact. When the entire world leaves you, and if everyone leaves you in the world, one place you know you can always return back to is your parents. Your mother and your father, sometimes you may just be...